So, yes, my name is Eric Steele. I'm the release manager for the Clone uh, Content Management System project. Um, uh, you can reach me on Twitter or pretty much everywhere at eSteel. Um, feel free to tweet at me and I will answer any questions afterwards. Um, I'm here to talk about um, generational change within open source projects. Um, Lynn Moody uh, wrote a great article called uh, Learning from the Diaspora, about, uh, which is a failed Facebook uh, clone. Um, he said, the open source world is many things brilliantly, but the one thing it does badly is planning for leadership succession. Um, and so the clone community suffered a huge setback um, when we lost a large number of our leadership and our, our contributors. Um, and so I, I want to help you avoid the same defaults um, and because leaving your project is scary. Um, but it's actually possible to go through, get through the process without um, being completely harmed, um, and you can actually make positive change from it. Um, because really, the only difference between rats fleeing a sinking ship and rats making room for new rats is whether or not the ship sinks. Um, so a little bit about phone. Um, in 1999, uh, Alan Runyon and Alexander Levy uh, started the project uh, as a usability layer on top of the Yuzo um, application server, which very badly needed a usability layer. Um, we had a little sharp hand logo of Alan's girlfriend and dog. Um, that's, that's the closest to a cat picture right now, I'm sorry. Um, so we made the first public release in 2001, in 2003 the first uh, production release. Uh, fun facts, we actually, um, you, you may have seen some of our work. Um, we are, our, our style sheet and our, our icons were borrowed by the Wicked uh, Media Wiki project. Um, so you'll see those on Wikipedia if you use the uh, monobook design. Um, yeah, so, and it's still there today, which I found amazing. Um, we are named after an electronic band. Um, we played a lot of shiny, happy electronic music. Um, so just to, just to compare and contrast, we are both shiny <laughs> The clone band has made one public release, we've made 87. So uh, <laughs> we've, I think, won in that respect. Um, their copyright is owned by a uh, record company, and ours is owned by a foundation, um, which is made up of the clone community. Um, we have no employees. Um, I am the closest thing to one uh, as the release manager because I get a stipend whenever I make a release, which are fairly few and far between. Um, and I think I figured it works out to be about 25 cents per hour. <laughs> it's, it's nice that they think of me, but, yeah. Um, so, uh, in 2005, uh, Martin Stelly, one of our biggest contributors, wrote uh, uh, his master's thesis on clone, on the clone model of a mature open source project. Um, and it was a really interesting time in the project because um, the, one of the founders, Alan Runyon, was kind of moving away from the project, getting more involved in his own business um, and uh, building things around clone. Uh, and uh, Alexander Levy was moving up into the middle dictator role. Uh, so, and we are getting more and more contributors to the project. We had just created the Clone Foundation, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it holds the copyright to our code base. Um, it basically acts as a representative for the community to any legal issues that may come up. Um, and Clone Solution, which was Levy's company, changed its name from Clone Solutions to Yarn, uh, the Norwegian, um, to make it clear that the community held full ownership of the project and not the one company. So we've had this real culture of um, very uh, flat, um, what's what I'm looking for, very flat uh, leadership. Um, there's any time a company or a person tries to present themselves as being more involved, more involved, or more important than their uh, and their contributions are shown, they tend to get pulled back down um, just because, as a group, we just don't want to it. Um, so, the biggest thing we do is spreads. Um, and this, the Zoop group claims they started these uh, back in 2001. Um, basically, it's a, it's a session where we get everybody together for a two week, um, can be between five and 40 developers all working on uh, the same project uh, to accomplish a goal. Um, basically, <laughs> basically is an excuse to go to really cool places and stare at our laptops for a few days. Um, I've gotten to go to Cape Town, to Brazil, to Spain, to Amsterdam, and it's been amazing. 
um, but I get to see very little of the city. Um, I, luckily, I'm able to take my wife along to a lot of them, and she'll go out sightseeing and come back and tell me what's actually happened in the, in the city. I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, so yeah, a lot of our development culture is happening in these sprints. Um, so you bring together five or more developers from just geographically in our disparate areas, uh, and they start to communicate, they start to become friends. Um, and that's something we see over and over um, uh, through, uh, through our community. Uh, so this is where the majority of our development happens. There, there are no companies, no people paid to work on them. Um, and this is really where we train on people, both in the code and in the culture. Um, so this is the archipelago sprint. Uh, this was in Norway a long time ago. This is one before my time. Um, but our, our legends in our community are based around these events. Um, this is one where uh, there was no actual network connectivity at the cabin they were staying at, so they actually had a, had a local SVN server that they would carry to the other end of the island every day to sync up with the mainland. Um, this is Castle Golding. We actually have an Austrian prince in our community. Um, and he's held two sprints at his castle. And again, these were before my time, but these are legendary because Oh, it's uh, a castle because yeah, it's a castle. Yeah, yeah, because it's a castle. So you say, we're going to have a sprint at a castle, and 50 people from all over the world will immediately say, yes, I will be there. Um, basically, you had developers in the ballroom, in the dining room, in the wine cellar. <laughs> and it's amazing. Uh, and they got so much work done, actually, surprisingly. Um, but the most surreal thing from the sprint, and this is the story we tell to our children in the community, um, that uh, there's, a, there's a famous piano there in this very beautiful ballroom, um, and they brought in a famous pianist to play it, and it was a live TV show that was happening at the same time as the sprint. And so you see the camera pan across the room, this beautiful classical music was playing, you see the piano, you see the paintings on the wall, the gorgeous chandelier, you see a couch with three developers staring at their laptops, and one looks up with tears streaming down his face from the sheer beauty of it. Um, oh Somewhere this exists on video, and I've never found it. Um, so I may be completely wrong, but this is how the story has evolved over time. Um, so we see quotes, and um, this is again from Martin's uh, paper. Um, basically, the face to face communication we have in our community uh, is really, uh, has made us very good friends, and that makes it very hard to get angry at people over the code because it's just code, because you're awesome. Um, and again, uh, Paul Everett, uh, the Plum community is, is a tangible, warm, friendly, inviting thing to me. Uh, it's the people that make Plum what it is. Uh, again, it's the people. Working with the Plum community feels like working on an NGO, something done right. Um, there's a thing uh, that's on Yahoo called the Competitive Spectrum, which is a really interesting read. Uh, but talking about the different types of communities, uh, from combative to cordial, collaborative, and caring. Um, most projects actually live in this collaborative area. Um, I think Plum tends to trend more towards caring, caring area. Um, so we we really joke that Plum is more a support group based around really a horrible piece of software, but <laughs> it, it, it's it's a wonderful place. Um, and so we we uh, and so uh, uh, this is something from Scott actually. Um, she says it's hard not to see how communities place in this spectrum can influence everything from appropriate. Leadership to rewards for participation. I shouldn't made this on my slides. <laughs> uh, so, what kinds of online forums or real world meetups will work best for the group? So, this is really, and she talked about how um, the way the community works uh, affects how it um, gets together. In our case, it's actually been the opposite of how we got together. It's really shaped how the community works. Um, and I know this is a lot of touchy feely stuff, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, I mean, when you get teary leaving an event, when, when a developer hugs you and says he loves you and not in a creepy way, I mean, that's, that's who we are. Um, so I, I'm telling you all this touchy feeling crap because so that you know that when things went bad, it went very bad. This is exactly what we were trying to save. Um, I like the software we build and I like the people better. Um, so by the time of the 2011 conference in uh, San Francisco, um, it was becoming very obvious that um, more and more people were drifting away, a lot of the, the more senior people in the project, and it became very noticeable. Um, several let us know that they were taking new jobs, they wouldn't be doing Plum anymore. Um, quite a few fled to Mozilla um, to help me uh, pay for his new Lotus. Uh, 
we found out later that people were going there on their own accord, um, and he was still claiming the, uh, the uh, referral bonus, so he, he made up quite well. Um, <laughs> Uh, others were just yeah, saying we don't do uh, much clone anymore. Um, Yarn, who was formerly Clone Solutions, uh, dissolved uh, into several different companies. One, uh, which was a startup making cryptography software, uh, a couple more that were doing, still doing clone consulting. Uh, but it was really a big, um, big blow because they were the people we looked to as leaders. Um, of, the two, of the 13 people that Martin interviewed in his thesis, only two were left in the community by this time. Um, it really, that, that conference felt like a last go around, um, and I really personally had a really hard time with it, and even the giant battle bots we had. Um, <laughs> um, and then I, in 2012, a book came out um, that completely changed the way I was looking at things. Um, this is a collection of essays uh, that cover um, all kinds of different aspects of open source software. Um, so things like make backups, and how to run your server, how to manage your community, uh, how to triage bugs, and things like that. Um, when, it, when I first became release manager, I had no idea what was going on, and I actually went to Google and asked how to be a release manager. Um, so this book is pretty much the manual I've always wished I had. Um, there's this chapter four in there is uh, called "Prepare for the Future Evolution of Teams in Free Libre Open Source Software," um, and it's by uh, Felipe Ortega, um, and it, it introduced this idea of generational turnover. Um, basically, we lead projects. New people replace them, and that's how it was. <laughs> it was a revelation. Um, this is exactly what we were dealing with. Um, it's something that everybody faces, so it, it, was, it was very good to know that other people had gone through this and survived it. Um, it put a name to the problem and let me down this rabbit hole of really interesting research. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few of the, uh, the papers, um, kind of the ones that were referenced by everybody. Um, so these are from the early 2000s. Um, but if you're interested in looking for more, um, think, if you search for things like relay, turnover, uh, knowledge loss, uh, orphan code, um, that'll really get you where you're going to need to go. Um, so the first one is called uh, Contributor Turn Turnover and Lead Right Software Projects. Um, it really uh, it defines three different kinds of models of projects. Uh, the first is code guys. So these are projects where the, the founders have remained uh, heavily invested in the project throughout the entire length. Um, the second is multi-generational, which is where most projects fall. Uh, uh, so you'll see one generation of uh, developers or contributors um, show up over time, and another one will take their place, and it will just keep continuing. And the composite model is, is a mixture of the two. Um, there's some turnover. Uh, usually there's a like, group that begins at the start that is highly involved throughout the project. Um, and, So yeah, they stick around. Um, yeah. So uh, the, like I said, the vast majority of the uh, projects fit in this multi-generational uh, area. Um, and so the, they studied 21 different projects in there, and um, only three of the groups, uh, only three of the groups of study fit in the Code Gods model. Most were in the multi-generational, and there were a few that were composite. Um, and as I said before, the uh, with, with Martin's paper, uh, we were really reaching a point where we were shifting from this code, uh, this code gods spot into a multi-generational. Um, so we were losing the original group of founders, um, but there was a new, a new uh, generation of people coming up. Um, the problem with these papers is uh, that the graphs are basically PDFs of scans of photocopies of photocopies of guys. They've been through MS, MS Paint. Um, so I, I wish I could show them to you. Basically, they look like this, um, if they didn't suck. Uh, so basically showing the, the rise and fall of each generation of contributors. Um, normally, this, this turnover is happening uh, continually. Uh, so as one generation is diminishing, another one is, is rising up. Um, and really, the pitfall is dropping the, the, the baton between the relays. Um, so what happens when senior contributors leave? Well, knowledge ones, because if they, aren't passed, if they aren't there to pass it along, it doesn't get passed along. Uh, so that's, that's the code history, that's the, or the history of your organization, that's the history of your culture. Um, and it's really difficult to recover that because it's scattered across many places. So people's brains are the worst ones. Uh, you'll find it on mailing lists and tickets uh, and documentation. Um, and really, if that knowledge is not shared, it is gone. Uh, and that's the, that's, the, that's the danger of these generational changes. 
Um, so, uh, this is from another paper. The knowledge system is not the individual, but the entire history of problem, sol problem solving in which individuals participate. So, no single person knows everything there is to know about the project. Uh, and it's important to build in that redundancy across the across country groups. Um, another paper called Using Software Archaeology to Measure Knowledge Loss in Software Projects to Develop Return Number um, actually took a look at, at uh, commits to decide um, how much of that uh, loss is happening. Um, so, the, the problem with this is it's only looking at code contributions. So we're, not, we're not really looking at things like documentation or uh, lead, uh, leadership organizational um, involvement. Um, but because this is an easy metric to actually look at, it's, uh, everything focuses on code. Um, it's actually going to be interesting to see over the next few years uh, as we move into move our do uh, documentation into things like uh, read the docs. Um, it'll actually become a little bit more. We'll have a little bit more ability to see who's contributing to when. Uh, so basically, they yeah, like I said they looked at commit histories um, and determined who the, the current development team is, uh, and then count lines of code that haven't been touched by them. Um, so, and consider those orphans. Uh, and so, orphan code, and they consider orphan code to be knowledge um, So, and so they looked at they looked at different projects and stuff, and uh, decided that the healthy project had a low and decreasing uh, number of uh, orphan lines of code, uh, and dying projects had a large and increasing. So, um, they put a healthy project around twenty percent, uh, which I think is pretty good, but it's kind of hard to keep up with. Um, so if we look at those graphs again, this is where knowledge loss happens, where there's a larger gap in between each generation. Um, so as we uh, move farther away from previous generations, there's a bigger chance to drop a large amount of knowledge. And so knowledge retention, we really want to move those uh, back together again. So they looked at uh, how to measure generations. Um, and they found that uh, really it's a very small, uh, very focused group of contributors that do most of the work. Um, and they found that it took developers around 30 months, two and a half years, to actually get spun up to be um, a fully contributing member of the group. Um, they, they came up with a measure of half life for developers. So when half of the group of people contributing in that time period were gone, that's the half life. So they put Debian uh, at around seven and a half years. Um, I think Clone is probably around five to six. Um, but the but the interesting thing is uh, looking at that, uh, comparing the lifespan of your developers with the amount of time it actually gets them started. So you've got seven and a half years minus two and a half. So you, so you only have about five years of really productive time. And if your project takes longer here or less time here, um, you can severely reduce that amount. So I, I want to talk about how we've dealt with uh, generational change. Uh, the first thing is identifying turnover, um, surviving, the, surviving the, the, the people leaving the project, um, rebuilding momentum, and then planning for the generation that comes after ours. Um, so for that, identifying turnover. Um, basically, it feels like this. Um, everybody's giving up, we're doomed. Um, and chances are, if you notice it, um, you're likely one of the people <laughs> uh, picking up the pieces. Um, this is exactly the process we went through. Um, a number of us were just throwing our hands up in the air, saying somebody needs to do something, and then just going, oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> shit, I'm somebody. <laughs> exactly, I, I'm somebody. Um, so the first thing you want to look at is why is everybody leaving? Um, so if, if your software sucks, that's a big problem. If your community sucks, that's another big problem. Um, people may just be getting bored with your project. Um, or in our, our case, it was, it was large economic shifts. Um, this was when the, uh, the economic downturn was happening throughout most of the world. Um, and especially since we uh, had a heavy user base in both America and, and Europe, uh, we were feeling it quite, quite a bit. Um, so, and Python jobs were gaining uh, momentum at that point. So there was a lot of lucrative opportunities for people to move on. Um, so again, if you want to look at how everybody's leaving, um, there's a denial stage where everybody says, no, I'm totally still going to help you out. It's like, nah. Um, there's the tumbleweed, uh, where you just say whatever happens to that guy. Um, and then the rage comes, where you get uh, graphs, so people making blog posts of graphs that show that your development team will be 70 by the time of the next release. <laughs> that may or may not be a true story. <laughs> Um, so your options at this point are either to carry on or just give up. Um, and so 
And this is really where you point to take stop and take stock of your community. Um, can you keep going with the people that are that are left, or are, are you just done for? Um, what do you need to do to replace the people that have gone? Um, and how much knowledge loss have you suffered? So um, basically, we ask people, you know, uh, how do you feel about things? What's going on? And we got this response from pretty much everybody. Uh, I said, I'm not working with Plenty anymore. I really miss everyone. And so that, that really brought home again the idea of the community that we had um, and how much it meant to everyone. Um, so we took a lot. We took a hard look at our project, saw there was still quite a lot to be excited about, not just the community but in the code base. There was some really nice things happening, and uh, we felt that the people we had left uh, could could easily handle it. Um, so that's what we decided to see. Um, the first thing we did was to put a, um, a name to it. Um, so I, I made a blog post. Uh, it was called Plum in the Second Day, Decade. Um, this happened about the time of our uh, tenth birthday. Um, first of all, really what we wanted to do was to put a name to it and to let everybody that was left know that somebody was paying attention. Um, so first of all, people people move on, and if you're worrying about it, it doesn't do anything for you. Um, second, we had the same number of dedicated, awesome people that we did before. Um, it's just the, the knowledge is spread out over more people, which is actually a good thing. Um, because it makes it a lot harder to, to lose that in the future. Um, previously, we had um, some people who were massive contributors and a lot of people that were just very small, and we've started to um, share that workload over more people. So it's, it's great. So that when one person, one, when one person leaves, it's not catastrophic. Um, so. Yeah, so we could increase the diversity with our abilities, our job, uh, location, and otherwise we just did a really horrible job of uh, recognizing and making use of that. Um, and really, these are good problems to have because we can actually solve those. Um, <coughs> so it was really a positive message, uh, call to action for us. Um, and of course, somebody followed that up with a blog post that said, "Code is dead, long live right, life right, um, because I don't know why. <laughs> um, they, they referenced my post and I have yet to figure it out. Um, I think some people are just jerks. Um, so, how do you get through the? How do you get through everyone leaving? Um, burnout is a really major problem in open source projects. Um, people tend to take on a lot more work than they can actually handle um, because they feel obligated to, obligated to the community, um, and they, until they just really can't keep up anymore. Um, and when your when your colleagues are walking away from a project in, in this in this period, it's very easy to do the same. To just get up and, and follow up with that. Um, so, we've kind of developed a, uh, a new way of doing things with our teams. Uh, we, have, we have a framework team that gets together to look at our. Um, yes, thank you. Sorry, you hear me. Yeah, so we have a framework team that evaluates new features coming in. Um, and it was, it was always a fixed term, and these would last from one to two years, depending upon how long it took us to get the release out. Uh, we found that we had a lot of problems because we would say, someone would say, oh yes, I'll, I'll, I'll evaluate this proposal and I'll, I'll be in charge of it. And then we wouldn't hear anything from them. And so it would take a lot of time and effort just, you know, like, hey, when can you get that to me? Like, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. And so we got into this cycle of, I want to help the project, but I don't have time, so I feel bad about it. And I feel bad, so I should really do something to help the project. And we just, you know, snowball. Um, so we really wanted to remove the guilt of stepping down. So I, I'd rather know that you're not working on something than hope that you are. Um, and so yeah, we gave the people the ability, we, we set up a, a hop-on, hop-off system for our uh, so that if, if life got to be too much for you, you could just leave and come back if you wanted to. Um, so it really removed the stigma of setting down. Um, we really wanted to say, and, and so when people leave now, we're saying thanks for helping, not uh, where have you been. It's, it's made a big difference, I think. Can I ask you about that or Oh, no, go right ahead. Uh, what does it mean to have a hop on hop off system? Do you have a wiki page where people are like on for a vacation? Or? We, uh, people will uh, let the rest, so we meet uh, bi weekly. Someone will say, I've, got, I've just got too much going on. Um, I, need, I need to step down for now. Um, we'll say, okay, thank you, uh, that's fine. And we'll let other people know that there, there, is, uh, there is an opportunity to join the team if you're interested. So, um, people will come in uh, at any point in the process. Before it was, it was okay, we're starting point five, here's our team, and here's our team when it's done. And so over that process, we've gone through 
uh, on about me, it, the, actually the, uh, the makeup of the team changes quite a bit at that time now. Um, so that when we started out, we had 12, and then it went down to eight, and then a few more people joined to 10, and so it's, it's evolved at a time. But yeah, it's, it's been interesting to see that change and how new people coming in, we have to re-explain uh, our rationale for certain features, and it's actually been better for us because we have to justify everything we've decided. Yeah. Okay, um, so, oh, you end. Wait till okay. Um, so, uh, so rebuilding momentum. Um, uh, we we had. Uh, I, I hate to admit it, we had sort of a uh, little uh, cadre of um, conspirators that got together and started working on how we can fix this. Um, and so there's a big long list of stuff that I won't go over. Um, basically, they were very agreeable ideas, something that everybody could get behind. Um, and it basically boils down to uh, transparency in communication, uh, really focus on community building, and we to spend our money on things that work. Um, that last one is actually a big change for us because the foundation board has always taken a kind of church and state mentality when it comes to development. We don't want to let any one person have the power to influence development uh, with from their official position. Um, there's a great quote from uh, one of our uh, former members that uh, said, Cloan does a great job of taking politically ambitious people and sticking them into positions where they can't do any harm. That's pretty much what our board was. So, so this idea this idea of letting that board um, put money into development sprints was pretty uh, major for us. Um, but the great thing was we started to see this rhetoric that we use popping up elsewhere. We can see this in a decade. And, and a lot of that stuff um, from the pe other people running for the board, from people just kind of reaffirming that, yes, I do clone. Um, and it was, it was really kind of cool to see people getting behind us and using that common language. Um, so when people are leaving, this is actually a great opportunity to take out the trash. Um, as Ron Emanuel says, uh, never waste a crisis. <laughs> so what we did was we said uh, to the people we left that left, we love you all, we miss you terribly, but this is our project now. Um, so we were able to take a look at our roadmap and get rid of some pet projects that just were never going to work. Uh, yeah, so this is our chance to get rid of those. Um, we had chance, we had points where people popped up to say, you know, hey, you keep a bit of that. And we said, well, come back and fix it. And, okay, I get it. So, um, I used to work at a large university, um, and they were planning uh, renovations to the student union building. Um, the students got really upset um, about the expansion plans because it was going to take away about a third of the, uh, the commons along uh, where I've been hung out. Um, and there were protests, there were. Um, uh, petitions? Yes, that's it, petitions. Thank you. Um, and, but I'll never forget this quote from one of the uh, administrators. He said, Just wait five years and this will be the way it's always been. And I thought at the time, like, you're an asshole. But he's right, because as soon as all those students had cycled through, Everybody there, <coughs> the, the people there, that was the size of the hub long had always been, because even though it was a third, third smaller, it, that had never existed. Um, so this is your chance. As new people are coming into your project, they don't know the old hangups you had, the old problems, and you can actually redefine who you are as a project. Um, and this is really your chance to ditch the asshole in your project. Um, we had people that really weren't the sort of people we wanted in the project, um, and their protection was gone now. Um, they had the production of some higher ups and they weren't around, um, so this is our chance. Um, I'll give you one quick trick, trick for fixing that. Um, use the panic of the exodus as a uh, way to kick them out the door. So, we're done for, you were right all along. Yeah. Um, all right, so we, we also started looking at friends in our community. Um, so, we're watching for rising contributors. Um, we, we use Olo for now. Um, it's a good start. Um, it takes a lot of gardening on our parts, um, but it's really nice to just kind of look through that, see who's really starting to take off and say thank you. We want to reduce that 30-month um, that uh, startup time as much as we can. Um, we're starting to get them into mentorship programs as we know this. Um, so again, say thank you um, really makes a huge difference for people. Um, people need that show. Um, and really, so this is my slide we saw earlier. Um, we're, I'm finding myself doing a lot of evil little things to make manipulate people into doing stuff, um, and that's apparently called leadership. <laughs> um, so, we use trolling quite a bit. Um, we're, we're, 
our community is so closely knit that we were able to to really um, kind of take some pleasure in, in trolling each other now and then. Um, and it's all done good naturedly. Um, I, before I get too far with that, I want to give a quick shout out. Um, this is our board president, Paul, um, who uh, had his birthday last week at a Employment events. Um, and I really want to give a big shout out to Drew Wolf, who got their hat on there. Uh, um, so, uh, one, of the most, one of the most awesome people I know has created some scripts. Um, he tracked our mailing list. Uh, and so, we'll, if, if things start looking a little quiet, we'll start to throw some grenades in there. So, like with developers, we'll should we switch form libraries, which is the CMS uh, version of uh, the Vins versus Emacs. Um, and asking who broke the middle because everybody has. Uh, our foundation members will uh, make full grammatical changes to the code of conduct and uh, the Germans will go crazy. And our documentation team will say, we're a CMS, why are we using read the docs? So I, I can take the share these because I, I, I'm afraid they won't work anymore. Um, but if they're good, people won't because people can't help it. So they, um, and basically, this just reminds people that uh, there are other still rounds. Um, usually, a smaller issue gets noticed in that whole uh, dust up, um, and that, that gets fixed. And plus, it amuses people. <laughs> um, so, really, we decided to double down one thing that works for us, which are our sprints. Um, so, I mentioned the sprint funding earlier. Um, we we sunk twenty five thousand dollars of our money. We have a war chest that we weren't using into our sprints. Um, so, you can very obviously see where we were dying off. Uh, last year we had 18 sprints. Um, these are funded. We give money to get uh, important people to uh, faraway places. We get um, new people to interesting places um, where, where they can learn things. And uh, we take our clone road to the places where we really haven't been before. So we actually got to go down to uh, South Africa last year um, and bring kind of the clone community to, to them because they haven't had the opportunity to join us in Europe or America. Um, so, uh, I was at a sprint in Amsterdam last year, uh, we took a boat rider on the canals, um, and somebody looked at the group and said, do you ever stop and think that we get to do stuff like this because we're programmers of free software? <laughs> and that's really the mentality we've taken. Um, at the, in Seattle, uh, 18 of us came to a beach house, um, made for 12, we worked on uh, leadership, uh, logging and user management features, um, and it's great to have 18 men and women in the house, uh, no problems, we uh, took turns cooking and cleaning. We had a project manager that came and decided she didn't want to do any actual coding. She spent the morning doing requirements documents and the evening uh, or the rest of the day just project managing the hell out of the kitchen. Uh, doing dishes is a great way to engage your uh, back-end processes in your brain. Uh, so we all took turns doing that. Uh, we had somebody that acted as a DJ, somebody that acted as a bartender. Um, and it all worked out really well. And at the end, we, we left uh, the place cleaner than it was when we got there, um, which I think is really the the mark of a mature open source project. <laughs> so our, our sprints are getting bigger. Um, we're actually having problems spending the money because people are being really thrifty with it. Um, they're finding new uh, sponsorship. They're they're getting cheaper airfare. Um, they're spending their own money because they want this to happen for everyone. Um, and so uh, what's it we uh, yeah we actually had a proposal for a marathon, which is a month long event. Um, people would essentially take up residence at one of our companies in uh, the middle. That almost happened, uh, I, but nobody with a family could actually do it. Um, and we want to provide avenues for involvement. Um, so basically, um, I'll quickly go through these. We want to rebuild our team structure. These are units of belonging. Um, and it's going to sound familiar. It's used to pass down stories, experiences, and life lessons to the new generation. Um, because really, the, the, so we have to, the default state of the software community is actually just the software. Um, we, we gave so much problem. We, we, we gave so little attention to the soft skills uh, as things were dying off. We lost all that leadership. Uh, and really, we just became a software project and we needed to spend quite a lot of time uh, rebuilding the rest of it. Um, I'll skip over this. Uh, I, yeah. So, for 10 years, Amy was our um, BFL. Uh, he was the one who got up and gave our State of Plum talks uh, represented us outside the community. And I'm finding it interesting to see we've really prided ourselves on not being a media fell, but we're missing something. And uh, I, I keep thinking of this propane guy. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers these commercials. Um, 
Um, it was basically some poor homeowner who had burned a turkey or had a cold shower in the sky and a t-shirt that said propane would come in and ex extol the wonders of propane and fix everything. Um, and a, a friend of mine uh, did a website for the Propane Council and uh, met with the board of directors and showed it to them. And he said it was amazing because every time he showed something, they all turned and looked at this man who was sitting with them and asked his opinion. And whatever, even though he knew nothing about business, nothing about uh, web design, he was an actor, he'd become the face of propane, <coughs> what he said carried weight. Um, I'm finding myself getting pushed into the hole, which is why I'm here today. Um, this is a picture from the Cape Town students. Um, I said, you can't use that, um, but they insisted on um, basically things. One, my beard looks horrible, and two, that's a picture of me telling somebody that Plumman is a wrong fit for his project. <laughs> Our, our Jenkins instance has a picture of my head on Chuck Norris's body with two machine guns. Um, it does nothing for my body image issues, um, but they love it, and so I'll deal with it. Um, basically, yeah, it, it makes it hard for me to be a cheerleader. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Um, so I'm trying to become an avatar with, for the community without being a rock star, because um, I just don't want that. Um, so first of all, if you're going to become the avatar, stick your, stick your weird tail thing in the brain of the flying thing, that's how it works. Somebody got it, thank you. Um, so I, I try to make my mistakes in the open, um, and I really try to put everybody else first because I know my voice carries so much weight um, that I can drown on everybody else. Planning for the next generation. So when you're finished up, uh, you, when you're cleaning, done cleaning up from the previous generation, it's time to start thinking about the next one um, because all this has happened before, and all this will happen again. Um, so, first of all, never ever leave, which doesn't really work. Um, but you want to build a culture of dealing with orphan code and projects. Um, get rid of them uh, because you don't want the next generation to deal with this. Uh, leave breadcrumbs, documentation, document everything your code, your processes, your community, uh, your legends, um, and really make new stories. Um, we have our shiny pants while you don't drink the blue stuff that's called the bird killer that the, uh, the Slovenians bring. Uh, and why there is now a sign at the Amsterdam Stable Airport that says, no, you can't bring a katana onto a plane. Um, this is the kind of horrible outreach we do. Um, and finally, if you're going to go, then just go. Um, don't hang around longer than you're actually going to be helpful. Um, and make sure that you tell people that you're going. Um, give advance notice to your departure. Help people uh, make that transition. So, as Eric Brennan says, when you lose interest in a program, your last duty is, is to hand it off to a company that's success, successful. Um, yeah. So, basically, generational doesn't have to be an issue, you just have to be ready for it. That's it. Uh, time for questions, and when someone asks a question, can you repeat it? Sure, it's recorded. Um, did you have any instances of people who had done that slow fade um, away thing um, and then when you did the this is our project thank you but we're moving on and then come coming back and interfering with things yes but they become so un sorry uh, the question is whether or not people who had left the project uh, were coming back to really uh, um, we had a, we had a bit of that. Um, we had a project that's kind of become this anchor around our neck. We haven't quite gotten rid of it yet. Uh, we had kind of really shifted the direction of it, and uh, we had somebody come back and say, you know, no, 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 this isn't the original vision. I said, well, the original vision is gone. You're gone. You know, the, if you're going to work on it, then then you got to say, but sorry, um, this is what works for us. Um, so yeah, it, it has happened. Um, but you just kind of have to wait it out um, because they will disappear again. <laughs> Do you have you used the uh, orphan code metric as a way to figure out what parts of the code to prioritize collaborating on with developers? I would love to. Um, I had somebody in this. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is whether or not we use the generation of looking at the orphan code to decide what we should work on. Uh, if we haven't done actual analysis of it. Um, I have a couple of people who are really into statistics that are starting to look at it, but we haven't gotten too far yet. Um, 
I think one area where, uh, so, so the project we're built, built on top of um, is pretty much, I mean, we'll call it dead. I mean, they, they're still making kind of minor bug fix releases, but nothing, there's no new development happening. And part of the problem that they have is that um, they can't get rid of something that somebody worked on because they worked really hard on that. So it still has support for Gopher, which, <laughs> so we're kind of, <laughs> Yeah. We, we don't need it, um, and so we're looking at that as just why why is this here? So we're actually looking at kind of taking that over, really stripping out the stuff that isn't needed, isn't being maintained. I have a question. Um, you talked about the onboarding time, and it was quite long, and I'm wondering if you've ever had like the limits about how long it takes to help somebody do who may not stick around and whether it's worth it. All the time, yeah. Um, um, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I know what you did there. I just can't um, So the question was, uh, uh, looking at the onboarding time, is it do we do we worry about people who just don't stick it out for that? Yeah. Um, we're we're starting up a mentorship project. Um, I'm still trying to find somebody to actively lead it. Um, somebody to keep an eye on, on new people coming in, and try to get them involved in simple projects that are very publicly. Um, or very, uh, uh, very public project. So it's something that everybody can see. It's a huge feather in their cap, um, and uh, really just kind of gives them a great start in, in developing with this. Um, but yeah, I, I think we've, we've had some people working on these projects that have disappeared halfway through. Um, but we just kind of bring in the next person. And as long as as long as we have a mentor working with them, we're able to see when they're when they disappeared. Find something else to pick up the sign. When you're talking about um, contributors, are you just looking at um, focusing on code contributors? Or are you focusing on the people that contribute the soft skills in regards to design or advocacy and areas around that? Right. Uh, so, um, uh, the question was whether or not we're looking uh, when we say contributors, are we looking at just code or are we looking at uh, everyone throughout the project? Um, so the, you know, the, the research, these research all focuses on contributors, that's where the metrics are. We are trying to, uh, we lost all those other people. So we had our, our, code, our, we had our coders, they were still doing stuff, they just keep doing stuff because that's what they do. But we just completely lost that other half of the project. Um, and we lost a lot of diversity for it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to build, rebuild that team structure, get people into those, funnel people into those areas of interest. Um, and yeah, one of the things I'm trying to make a conscious effort of is it's, we've always said core developer, um, and that really diminished the, the work that everybody else is doing because you know, I'm not a developer, I'm not important. Um, and so I'm trying to make a focus effort, effort to say core contributor um, because these are people who are helping the entire project um, and they don't. Well, what would be an example of a role that you would call a core contributor that was not a developer? Uh, what would be an example of someone we would call a core contributor who was not a developer? Um, so, someone who writes documentation for us, um, somebody who does UI work for us, um, our communications people. Um, that's one of, the, one of the biggest things we've done, um, is find people who are willing to talk about what we're doing. Um, because we need that both internally and externally. Um, People need in people in the project need to see that we're actively working on stuff and we know what's going on. And people outside the project need to know that we're still around. Um, Pwn's been around for 15 years now, um, and usually the reaction is either, "Oh, I remember those guys. I thought you were gone," um, or "Who?" So uh, we're really trying to make an effort to present ourselves to everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.